Welcome in to the Ots and Audibles podcast. Matt Prey, Eric Scopel, Jared Mack on this early Monday morning of the recording time because, uh, hey, a lot to get to today. It's that crazy season. It's right before National Signing Day. Holidays are here uh, trying to fit it all in. And we got some big news. Um, came out last night. Reason why we did not do an emergency podcast was because I felt like all of us needed to be on this podcast because Bo Nix is back. And that's going to be the focal point of this show. Um, This is huge news for Oregon. This is huge news for the Pac-12. This is huge news for Bo for Bo Nix and Dan Lanning. Um, He announced that he was coming back uh, with an Instagram post that just literally said "back," and it was like a movie poster. Uh, And then he had a a release on a video from Go Ducks, also talking about it and. Mind you, uh, I'm real curious to see, did he do this in between games between Mario Kart with Dan Lanning's kids? Because his wife shared a photo like right before it happened. Bo Nix at Dan Lanning's house playing Mario Kart with Dan Lanning's kids. Uh, really interesting there. But the big news, he's back, guys. And it's kind of what we thought was was trending this way from a lot, for the last couple of weeks. Yeah, no, you know, credit to Matt. He was tipped off on some good information. We heard some other things that were positive as well. And, and you know, regarding Nick's returning, and this is this sets Oregon up to be a real player again in the conference and potentially on the national landscape if they can shore up some very large deficiencies on this roster, which they're in the process of doing. We'll talk about a transfer portal commit that, a little bit later in the show that they landed as well. But, no, I mean, this is, this is I don't want to say best case because there's another element of a quarterback drama i guess that hasn't gone and doesn't appear like it's will be going best case but you know getting nicks back for another season with the way this offense played at its height this season really up until he was hurt i mean you kind of just if you i know this season was disappointing for a a myriad of reasons but again i'm not trying to make excuses i guess maybe i am but the reality is was was when oregon had a healthy bow nicks this offense was playing about as well as anyone nationally and the issues they had against Utah, the issues they had against Oregon State, I think you can, you know, offensively at least, I think you can credit a fair amount of that to the ankle injury, limiting the dual threat nature of what Bo Nix was in weeks previous to that. And you look at the the rushing totals after that, they really went downhill. So I think you can get really excited by what does an offense look like? And I go, I, I'd say year two with Bo Nix at the helm, obviously a different offensive coordinator. So a little, it's not, it's not the continuity is not in, you know, in, in totality back, but I think you can get really excited about what Oregon can do. And, you know, looking around the conference this year, some really high end quarterback play. And there's a chance that I think all of the top kind of contenders this year, with the exception of UCLA return their quarterbacks, setting up the conference to be really, really exciting again. And, Sadly, it'll be the swan song for the two LA schools. And I say sadly because the, this was setting up to be – the conference is actually kind of getting fun again, you know, which is, of course, the sad part about this. But that's that's another topic for another day. Um, big news for Oregon, obviously. And I think I, I also have to know – one of the first things that popped up in my head is this is now twice in like a two-week period that we've spoken with an Oregon coach or player that had big news to – release that within 24 hours of that said media scrum an official announcement has been announced which is just kind of interesting like you go back like dan landing is like yeah i don't know when we're going to announce a offensive coordinator and then like 14 hours later we're doing a podcast reacting to it and we asked bo on friday about what his future with the nfl was or the oregon we talked about on this podcast after he didn't have an answer and then of course what about 48 hours after that, he's announcing he's returning. So um, I don't know if that means much, but it's just sort of an interesting trend to this last month here of no answers shortly after, very clear answers, both of which I think are positives for the program. Yeah, absolutely a positive for the program. Bo Nix with the late Sunday night news dump, um, take a, you know, almost a professional level news dump on that one during the middle of, of NFL weekend. Um it's a it's a very big positive for Oregon. You know, we had the discussion on the last podcast whether you would take one year of Knicks or three years of more, uh, depending on the recruitment situation. 
Um, I think the consensus between us and the consensus, well, not the consensus, but the majority between us and the majority of the comment section below our video on YouTube was that they would take the one year of Bo Nix. Well, here it is. And like Eric said, this is a new offensive coordinator, Will Stein. But Bo, Bo's going to have plenty of time. I mean, we talked about it on the previous podcast where Will Stein is already in Eugene, was at practice. These are moments where they can begin to learn the offense, and he has another nine or ten months at this point to go and learn it to the best of his abilities. Um, you know, there's a gap between how long ago uh, – Nix and Kenny Dillingham worked together, but they learned that gap in a shorter amount of time. Obviously, there was, there was some uh, carryover effect from their days at Auburn, but that's still a, almost a new offense to learn. Maybe the terminologies are similar, but this is a, this is a great opportunity for Oregon. Um, this, sets up for this, this sets them up for the future, and especially going into next year. Um, and it's a great thing to have, and their offense was fantastic, and they're still adding weapons. I know that they're going to have a new offensive line, but there's still plenty of talented players on that offensive line. Um, wide receivers are continued to have um, – and Oregon needs to continue to add them, but right now they have a good set of wide receivers that um, can rival what they did last season. Still got Troy Franklin. Treshawn Holden is another, another another name to note and another good player out there. Um, it's great, but the offense wasn't the problem last year. And at this point, it won't be the problem again, this upcoming season. They, like Eric said, they just need to continue to fill in the gaps that they have there um, and continue to, you know, enhance the program and make sure that it doesn't, it isn't just uh, Oregon isn't just this good, good program for the Bo Nix years that they're able to keep going down the, down the line and further uh, with, with signing day coming up this next week. Jared's right. Like the defense still needs to get fixed, but when you have a quarterback the caliber of Bo Nix, he can overcome, he can cover up some holes that your program has. And that's the value of getting a NFL caliber, I'm not going to say first round or second or third round guy, but NFL caliber guy to say no to the NFL, wait for a second, I want to play one more year in college and come back. Uh, we've, we've seen it happen a ton of times, you know, Go back to the 2001 team with Joe Harrington as a senior. That defense was good. That defense was opportunistic. But that defense was not littered with NFL dudes. They were not this juggernaut team. They gave up yards, no doubt about it. They 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 got interceptions in the red zone and, you know, forced field goals instead of touchdowns, but they gave up yards. You know, we, we, we saw, you know, the 2014 defense was good. With Marcus Mariota and the offense was so powerful that all that that defense knew they needed to do was get two or three stops per game, and that would be the separation that was needed um, for Oregon to win a majority of its games. And that's going to be what the blueprint will probably be like in 2023, because when you have that special of a quarterback, even with a new offensive coordinator, his fifth in five years, remind you. Uh, just veteran good quarterbacks at the collegiate level, whether it's at Oregon or it's everywhere else can overcome and can mask a lot of your glaring issues. And that's what Oregon's going to get. And I think like to Eric's point, it's unfortunate the conference is seeing USC and UCLA leave after next season, because could the PAC 12 have three of the four or five most likely Heisen candidates going into the season? I mean, they've got the returner, returning winner, Caleb Williams, and then now Nix and Michael Penix at UW. There's going to be other names that will pop up, but you look at those three guys, those are three of the six, seven, eight best quarterbacks in college football this season, and we know a couple of the be better ones are moving on to the NFL after this year, and those three are coming back. So the league is going to be – really good. And, you know, I, I think a couple of years ago there was this idea and it was true. Like where did all the the gunslingers go in the conference? Like that's what the conference was known for is producing mm -hmm. NFL caliber players. And now, you know, a majority of the, of the league would have somebody, whether it was that upcoming NFL draft or in two years down the road that you could point to and say, that guy eventually will get into the NFL. And it looks like 
the league is kind of trending towards that direction once again. Yeah, no, and, and I think that's kind of how you have to look at it if, if you if you want to just be honest about where Oregon is at in this conference. Was you know part of, obviously returning Bo Nix is is huge for a, a myriad of reasons, but to continue to keep pace with USC and Washington in particular, who both have their again Heisman Trophy in one case winner in Penix's place case, I guess, I think he, he was one of the top 10 vote getters. So semifinalists, I guess is an appropriate term. Didn't go to New York city. I think you can make an argument that he maybe deserved a little bit more credit almost um, down the stretch, but to keep kind of pace with those teams, you needed to get your, you needed to, you needed Bo to come back or to land somebody who was going to be of similar requisite talent and I don't know where you were going to find a player immediately right like the, the whole Dante Moore argument we had with Jared and, and Matt and I the other day was in part because I don't think you expect a true freshman to come in and be ready to be that guy immediately it's just the odds of that happening are pretty slim in fact you look around the country over the last couple of decades there's very few instances where you could say that's the case where a true freshman has been immediately ready to do it maybe Dante is the guy what well, might be we might see at UCLA soon we can get to that in a moment here but by, by by having Nick's return, you you are keeping um, you're, you're holding pace. You're keeping up with Washington. You're keeping up with USC, who obviously have these really high end quarterbacks. And, and again, as Matt says, the league has three legitimate. I don't know. We want to. Yeah, I guess we can say Heisman Trophy candidate quarterbacks. Cause I think Bo Nix would have been more deeply in the conversation had he not been injured. And, and Oregon maybe if Oregon beats Washington. Penix is probably not in the discussion. But Nix becomes a figure. And that game was so close to going one way or the other anyway. So you can kind of look at it and say, hey, the conference could have three guys who are capable of winning it. I'm skeptical that the conference would win consecutive years because of the way it's perceived nationally. But we'll see how things play out. But regardless, it sets the conference up to have three marquee teams without including Utah, which I think you just have to include will be up there every year based upon what Whittingham has has, has built in, in Salt Lake City. So this allows Oregon to maintain serve. Now, now the question is, how do they get over the top? And I think they get over the top by improving on defense. You now, Matt's right in terms of, and, and so is Jerry. I think you guys both kind of made this point of, you know, Oregon had a lot of success this last year despite a lot of def defensive deficiencies, despite issues on special teams. At the end of the season, those issues caught up in part because the offense wasn't as prolific, because the offense couldn't do what it was doing before. And so you took up, you know, if you wanted to, to look at it in terms of uh, you know how str how strong certain elements of this team were. If the offense was a ten out of ten, the defense was a five out of ten, the special teams was a five out of ten. Hypothetical, just throwing numbers out here. Well, once you move the offense down three rungs to a seven out of ten, when you take away Nick's ability to run, well, the other issues become a lot more egregious. And I think that's what you saw happen towards the end of the season. So, if you're Oregon, if you can have the high powered offense, you can be competitive without question. It just comes down to when you get into these high pressure situations, you got to have a defense that's better, and that to me is what this off season is about. You look at the offense; there aren't a lot of glaring holes. You've got great running backs coming back. Obviously, you've got Nick's back. You look at receiver; I think you feel really good about where that is headed. Um, the offensive line probably would love to see a transfer to play at right tackle. You've had a couple guys come in, but that's basically it. I mean, they're 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 nine to nine out of 11 starters basically for being where they need to be you know they're only an addition or two probably from shoring things up to being again really high powered and even if they don't make an addition i think you could argue they'd still be pretty darn good defensively there is still a lot to address and we'll get to uh, the addition of Kyrie jackson alabama corner later in the show and kind of go deep down on that but i you know that's the point that jared made that's the point i made earlier of you feel really good about the offense. There's still so much to clean up on defense. And I think special teams is an area where there will be some personnel additions and, and adjustments made. But a lot of that to me is still, there's just, that's, there's some overarching issues that need to be addressed there, in my opinion. And, and we'll be curious to see how kind of what the process of fixing some of those issues is this off season. One more thing before we move on to more or Harry Jackson, however, we want what this podcast to go. Um, I, I, it's, it's a testament to the transfer portal that none of the best quarterbacks in the Pac-12 started in the Pac-12 with Knicks, with Caleb Williams, right. and with Michael Penix. So although there's a lot of complaining that goes out in the transfer portal about what happens and maybe the NIL issues and all that stuff, 
Uh, I don't think any of three of these quarterbacks would be in the Pac-12 if it weren't for some of those. Maybe it's NIL for for one or two or all three maybe, but definitely for the transfer portal. Um, it's important, and it puts the Pac-12 back on the map because like both of you guys mentioned, uh, quarterbacking was not a great thing in the Pac-12 the last couple of years. Um, when it, Again, no, no disrespect to Anthony Brown, but what Anthony Brown's numbers last season put him within like the top four or five yeah. quarterbacks in the Pac-12, that's not necessarily a great thing. And again, his season was fine. It was above average, but um, in years past, that would have been look, uh, looked at like Oregon fans did. In years past, it would have been looked at as a very potentially substandard season. So the, the quarterbacking that's going on in the Pac-12 is an elite level. Um, and now Oregon has another year of an elite quarterback um, with, with Nick's now that he's, you know, feeling his ankles feeling better. He's going to have a whole off season, obviously to rehab it and everything like that. Um, and yeah, I think that's, yeah, it's, it's great that Nick's is back and that Oregon definitely needed it considering that they didn't have a obvious option. I mean, there are plenty of options in the portal as well, but Nick's was the, was this number one option here um, despite our, our conversation about three years of more, one year of Knicks, and Nick was still number one. That segues us right into uh, Dante Moore. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, hasn't made a decision as of 8.19 a.m. Pacific time on December 19th, 2022. Knowing our track record, guys, the last couple of days of or weeks of major topics to discuss, offensive coordinator, Bo Nix's potential return decision to leave. It wouldn't surprise me that we find out the conclusion of Dante Moore's recruitment an hour after this podcast ends. Um, that's where our, that's where our track record is going. But all all signs right now point to uh, Oregon losing its first. I should note this first verbal commitment for the 2023 recruiting class um, to UCLA. Uh, Dante Moore would become the first guy to flip that's committed to Oregon in this cycle. Unfortunately, it happens. It would happen three days before um, National Signing Day. But at least you have some clarity. You know Bonix is back. You doubt. You now more than likely need to go and find another quarterback. I don't know uh-huh. what direction that is. We've certainly heard a lot of things about what Oregon is doing behind the scenes with Bo Nix coming back, Dante Moore flipping. Not yet ready to release that publicly, but there is stuff in motion. Um, Where they go is going to be the interesting one. Can they flip another school's commitment? Is there a high school guy that's uncommitted, that's worth taking? Is there a JUCO guy that they go find? Do they go into the portal and do they try and find uh, a DJU and convince him to redshirt? I don't think that's likely. Uh, do they go and do kind of what UCLA has just done? And that's take uh, Kent State's starting quarterback and add him into the mix. And if they flip Dante Moore, basically, hey, you two are going to duke it out. Do they find a guy that's willing to come and sit for a year or even sit for a couple of years? And we should also know Ty Thompson's just sitting here. Like, he's still on the team, guys. And – he even, like, I think celebrated on social media Bo Nix's decision to return to Oregon. Um, I, I The story is almost I'm really pulling now for Ty Thompson to figure things out and, and turn it around because he has been cast aside, yeah. and yet no one counts on him. No one wants him to be at Oregon from a fan base perspective. I'm sure there's a, a, a good chunk of people that want him to be at Oregon, but I'm over-exaggerating. But he's just gone completely unnoticed, and yet he's still here. What can the development that he get next season? Uh, Quarterback position is going to be still widely viewed in my eyes in the next three days, three weeks, six weeks leading up to National Signing Day and then the second signing day in February. They do find themselves in an odd position um, because I think if hypothetically if you're a player in the portal, you're probably there because – you could be there for several reasons, but I would say the, the high majority of guys in the port are looking for better situations from a playing time perspective. And you go to Oregon, you're not finding it. I mean, I, I know you might pitch, hey, come compete for the job, but Bo Nix isn't returning to be a backup. 
And I don't think really anybody, you know, and, and I guess maybe you bring in somebody who has an incredible year and somehow beats Bo Nix out. I find that to be so far fetched that that's the outcome. So that pitch is hard because you're basically telling a guy to be patient in a sport where nobody, <laughs> nobody wants to be patient. That's why the portal is so prolific right now, because the intent is to go find a better situation now is it is short term. Let me go figure it out. Let me get a spot where I can display my skills. And I don't think if there are, there are very few players in the country that have any chance of displaying those skills at Oregon in 2023. So, you know, it, it, you, you're going to have to find somebody who is maybe the equivalent of a Jay Butterfield at another school where they haven't been the guy, but they're willing to wait for a little bit. I don't know who that guy is. If that guy exists. If that guy is that interesting. You're going to, I think you can take Hudson Card. That was the name we had before. Probably throw that one out the window. Hudson left Texas because he wasn't the starter. He's not going to Oregon to become a non starter there. I think that's pretty clear. Um, the prep avenue probably makes the most sense in terms of just adding another scholarship player because you, you could, you bring in a player and you pitch him and say, hey, Bo has one more year. And then the job opens. We have Ty Thompson around. You're going to compete with him. We'll bring in probably another prep in 24. Maybe we find a portal player to compete with you guys. But you'll have a chance by 2024 to really go out there and maybe win this job. And that could be a pitch that's maybe pretty compelling for a, a, a prep quarterback in this 23 class. But I find the portal to be just a hard sales job. It doesn't mean it can't happen, but that would be really impressive by Will Stein and his staff to – to go identify a starting caliber quarterback who maybe has starting experience at some level to say, Hey, come here. You're not going to start your first year. We can, you can use a redshirt year if you have one and then contend and compete for a job in 24. I just think that's a, a tough sales pitch. So probably most likely it will be somebody from the prep ranks from my perspective. And the Ty Thompson part of it's really interesting about, I probably feel very similarly. There, there would be something very poetic about, Ty somehow sticking around and winning the job in 24 and then actually being good like th that that outcome which I don't think is impossible would be I think kind of comical for this fan base to have to grapple with of I mean not that they not that this fan base is different than most fan bases but they just seem to write off people so quickly and for a guy that they wrote off year two based upon a couple of dozen snaps and I understand the snaps weren't good I'm not going to suggest they were but to, to write that guy off and then him end up being somebody of substance down the road. Because we have to remember, Ty was a very highly regarded recruit. And I was texting with a buddy of mine last night, and I know Jared knows this from watching all the practices, of just the immense physical gifts of Ty Thompson. I mean, watching the guy stand flat-footed and throw the ball 65 yards in the air like he can do, I mean, his arm strength and the physical tools are are off the charts. There's just a lot of other stuff. So maybe that's maybe that's not – totally out of the realm of possibility that Ty Thompson ends up being something of note by 2024. The fact that he would stick around perhaps that long, we have to know he could also enter the portal at some point, but if he were to stick around through 2024 and then win the job, that would be, there'd be something kind of poetic about that outcome. I know that's now talking about two different quarterback or a quarterback competition kind of to be named later, but that, that element that Matt brought up kind of, there's, there's some kind of humor to that if that ends up being how it plays out. I'm with Eric. It's got to be somebody from the prep because you can't. I don't think. I know. I don't think you can genuinely convince somebody who has starting uh, Division One Power Five level experience to come to Oregon to potentially be the third string quarterback. Given that Ty Thompson has been in the system for multiple years now, I know it's a new offensive coordinator, but he's been in Oregon for multiple years. He knows the ins and outs of the entire program. If you bring in somebody from the transfer portal, it's just going to be somebody who's i don't know maybe there for the free gear um because there's no way that they're beating out bo nicks and if they get the second position that's great but i don't necessarily think that oregon would want to convince somebody who has a handful of starts at the power five level to say hey maybe you could be the starter in 2024 because i don't necessarily think that's what oregon wants i think they want to continue to have this string of elite quarterbacks and as we've seen in the transfer portal this year um there should be no difference in the transfer portal next year in terms of potentially acquiring an elite quarterback in the portal and inserting them into your in your football team and saying, hey, there we go. There's our elite quarterback. If you grab somebody from the transfer portal this year who's 
limited in experience and might have potential and then assume that they'll just be the starting quarterback in 2024 after not playing at all in 2023, presumably, you're kind of in the same spot. There's no, you're not moving upward. You're realistically, you're moving backward because you lose Bo Nix and now you bring in a guy who might not necessarily have any of the experience. Um, I'm totally comfortable with Ty Thompson being the backup for another season. Um, Two-year backup at this point now behind Anthony Brown and Bo Nix this past year. Um, he's beaten out Jay Butterfield twice for that job. Now Jay Butterfield is out of the picture. Um, to Eric's points about his physical traits and his natural abilities, um, yeah, that's a great starting point with any quarterback. I mean, when you don't have those things and you're like a dink and dunk kind of passer, a game manager, a Mac Jones type of player, um, that's okay. You can still win with that. But when you have all of those physical traits that uh, you know you can't teach, you know, can't teach height, can't teach this natural kind of arm strength, um, you can teach them uh, how to read a how to read a defense. This is why Bo Nix is so important. On the other side of this, is when Nix was potentially out against Utah. Um, when we asked him how Ty Thompson was preparing, he was confident in Ty's ability. He's, he talked a lot about how he learned over the entire year, how they've gotten into deep conversations about how to read defense, things like that. You know, that to me is um, a positive sign that, that Ty, even though we never saw it on the field, that he developed this past season, which in, in the year prior, I don't think it was necessarily, at least not openly stated, that it seemed like he improved over the course of the season. Um, and again, I, I it's got to be somebody from the prep level who, who gets that third quarterback spot just because they need to add another quarterback. You can't have two quarterbacks on the roster. You need one more scholarship, at least quarterback. I know they'll have some walk-ons, but, and it's an opportunity to have that guy develop under Bo Nix, to learn from Bo Nix, who I think is, is, a different quarterback than Oregon has had in the past and his leadership and his understanding of football and his, uh, his overall IQ of the game. And, and honestly, everything else, I don't know. He seems like he's got his head on straight in terms of just, you know, being in a normal adult human being um, and more so than, uh, than other players that have, have come through the program. That's for sure. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll discuss Kyrie Jackson's addition and other recruiting notes. All right, welcome back to the Yachts and Nautilus podcast. Um, flipping over to a recruiting news here. Kyrie Jackson is the third transfer as of this morning, Monday morning, to give a verbal commitment to the Ducks. Alabama cornerback, um, to my knowledge, only has one year of eligibility and will come into a unit that needs a lot of help. You know, Christian Gonzalez, maybe your best player. Uh, defensively for sure. Um, but I think he's in that discussion with Bo being your best, best overall player, different than most impactful, but um, it's gone. He's off to the NFL. Dante Manning, TriQuest Bridges are what I would assume would be your perceived air quotes starters heading into next season. But I don't feel like either of those guys have shown enough where you definitively look at them and say, Yes, they are. They are 100% starting. Uh, they've got the job locked up at this point in December for next season. It's kind of open competition, and it needs to be open competition. Um, Kyrie Jackson will be the latest guy to, to come in here and, and try and maybe replicate what Christian Gonzalez did last season. Um, Big-time program at Alabama. What do we think of this addition? Is this someone that is – starter quality or is it kind of more in the lines of a talking to Tiamani last season, defensive tackle, different position. I understand that, but a guy that came from a good program that turned into being a role player. Cause those additions are just as important sometimes as adding starter guys as well. Yeah. I think it's fair to group talkie with Kyrie in terms of these are guys that are starting caliber players and then we'll see what happens when he gets on campus. I expect Kyrie Jackson to be, you know, impactful and have a chance to start just like I thought. I mean, we thought Taki was going to start when he got here and just so happens Jordan Riley, we probably undersold what he was able to do and Tamani still played a ton. And you're right, even if an, even if a transfer portal edition isn't a starter, 
assuming they can still contribute in positive ways, like that's still a victory out of the portal. And again, you, you look at the track record last year with landing with the, tr- the the portal additions, you feel really good. Jackson is a guy who, hey, this guy was starting in the national championship game last year for Alabama against Georgia. Like he has proven he can play at the top level. Now, uh, this year was not a year he, I think he had like 17 snaps like all season at Alabama this year. There's some on-field issues, off-field issues. Um, you hope that all comes together in a positive way at Oregon, but there's certainly no question he's talented enough. And given the issues you had at corner besides, you know, behind, I guess, Christian Gonzalez, there's no reason he can't come in and start and at least contend to be a starter. I mean, I, I would pencil him in right now as a starter. I'd like to see how the competition develops in the spring. I'd like to see, frankly, what do you do with Triquez? I mean, I, I, I thought he played okay down the stretch. I think he's better fit to play other positions defensively. I don't think he's a true cover corner personally. And he was a safety in high school. The previous staff had a hard time figuring out where he was. He had a hard time this year. I mean, he started spring at safety as one of the deep safeties. And during the offseason, they shifted him back to corner. And I've hypothesized that might have been in part because no one else really stepped forward as a clear cut number two behind Gonzalez. And they just felt, Hey, he's one of our best defensive backs. Let's get him on the field somewhere. And so he's, he's playing almost out of position. Like, I think there's a winning player with Triclos Bridges. If he's playing one of those deep safety spots next year, and you could find a couple people to fill in at corner, which is why I still think you have to be active in this portal at corner. I think you need to go find somebody. I think, Kyrie Jackson could be a starter. He might not. At worst, he's your probably third corner. Um, I'm not going to totally give up on Dante Manning, but it's tough at this point because it's been several seasons. Haven't seen a whole lot of production. Can't seem to win the starting job. If he sticks around and he wins a starting job and he has a great year, that's another one of those Ty Thompson-esque potential stories where you feel really good. Hey, he's a really highly regarded guy. Didn't pay out right away. Figured it out. Jaleel Florence, there's some younger guys in this roster who I like a lot. I think Jaleel Florence is a really high upside corner. So I think there's a lot of reasons why Kyrie Jackson can have a huge impact. There's also players in this roster who are capable, certainly, of competing with him for that job. Um, To the player, I'll throw it to Jared, who I just, it's funny, I do the film reviews, but it seems like we've kind of shifted it where you're the traits guy, Jared. So looking at Kyrie, he's six foot three, he's long, he, again, he has a end of last season at Bama, he was playing a significant role on a really good, obviously, Bama team that played for a national championship. What do you think there? Like, do, do you, how, I guess, what kind of writing utensil are you, are you marking him in as a starter? Is he a, is he a pencil? You pencil him in, you, you're sharpening him in. Is it a erasable pen? What, what kind of, pe- what kind of utensil? So many options. There are a lot. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. I was going to quickly touch on, we had this exact conversation last year with Christian Gonzalez. Like, is this guy a number one? And it turned out, yeah, Christian Gonzalez was a clear-cut number one cornerback after we learned, uh-oh, dog is barking. After we learned that through the spring ball that he was one of the more talented guys on the team. Um, but, you know, we'll have to wait for Kyrie Jackson. I really like his tape. I really like his size. He's six foot three. He's around like 200 pounds, kind of plays at that level. Um, long arms. He's very similar in build to Triquas Bridges. Um, I think his wingspan might not be as impressive as Bridges is. It's just like seven feet, seven one, which is absolutely absurd. Um, but really physical guy. Um, he's a Juco, Juco player, uh, transferred to Alabama or committed, transferred, whatever junior colleges do. Um, you know, like ranked the number one and number two cornerback in the country. I think the 24 seven top two, four, seven had him at number one. The composite had him at number two, very talented player. Like Eric mentioned, played a lot in his first year at Alabama, uh, suspended his second year, which I, I trust Dan Lanning and company to do to the due diligence of looking into that and, and knowing that he's, you know, it was suspended for a reason that, you know, um, is okay the fact that he comes to Oregon now. Um, but overall, I, to answer Eric's question, I think I think I might pen him in, erasable pen, because it depends what Oregon does for the rest of the portal. Because they, I think they need more cornerback depth. And But do they need more depth? Are they going to look for another impact starter? Um, are they looking to move Triquas Bridges back to safety where, like Eric, I believe he's – that's his position. I think he's probably the best there um, just because of his size and speed and length. 
Um, but you look at Jackson and he clearly has the intangibles. He clearly has the track record. The issue is, is that he hasn't played that many games. Um, I think overall it's 21 games in the last two years. Um, the first nine games this season where he played a limited amount of snaps on, on defense, most of it was special teams. And then 12 games is his first year at Alabama where, Again, limited amount of snaps at cornerback only till the very end of the season after some injury issues to the position for the for the Crimson Tide. Um, there's a, there's just a lot of question marks there with him if he's going to be a number one guy. And we had the same one with Christian Gonzalez, like I said. But with, with Oregon's cornerbacks um, and how they've performed last year outside of Gonzalez, who's no longer with the team, you know, there's not a – to me, there's not a clear cut guy that I would put a, ahead of him. Like, I still think Bridges would be your number two in this scenario. And maybe Triquez becomes a full-on cornerback and trains this entire offseason to be a cornerback and maybe not a safety. And he, and he really shows up and he shows out and he plays like he did down the stretch this last year for the entire 23 season. Then he's your number one. But until we see that, until we see spring ball, until we see the developments of Tucker, Dickerson – uh, Florence, maybe Darren Barkins, until we see the uh, Dante Manning, until we see the developments of those guys, I, I would, I would erasable pen Kyrie Jackson in as the number one cornerback. No, we still might see more departures from yeah. this position. Sure. sure, right. Like that, that could also factor in whether Kyrie Jackson is a starter or not because of who. If departs. everybody leaves. Yeah, then he'll be yeah, number one. You're right. If every if, if all the corners in the roster leave, I feel pretty <laughs> confident. I was not saying that. Will be a starter. I would sharpie it in. I would sharpie okay. that one. In. That's con- contingency plan. Good. All right, we got a couple more minutes here. Um, there are some, there is some good news trending Oregon's way on the recruiting trail uh, beyond just Kerry Jackson. Um, Yes, it looks like Caleb Presley is going to flip from Oregon to UW, which would sting, which would hurt. Um, but just like Dante Moore, if Bo Nix came back, I don't think even with the openings and the need for improvement, I don't think I was going to view Caleb Presley as a guy that was going to play significant snaps in 2023 in 13 games for Oregon. Um, doesn't mean he wasn't going to play. He was, but... I think that was more of a long-term hit here. But Oregon could go back into the state of Washington and steal four-star running back Jaden Lamar, who's currently committed to Notre Dame. Uh, That is progressing. That's where it's trending right now. That would be a good addition for Oregon. Uh, And then Oregon had two other guys uh, on campus that are looking at hard at Oregon or flipping. Um, Ashton Porter, a four-star defensive lineman, uh, which would be like their ninth defensive line or edge commit in this recruiting class. If that transpires, like we expect. And then Jamari Johnson of a Louisville commit, who's a tight end, potentially defensive end type player, all American too, by the way, he was also on campus and things are kind of progressing there as well. So um, see, Wilt Fong wrote a story on duck territory and 24 seven sports. I think it was like Friday or, Something saying, like, may not always be good news, but for Oregon, they may be the most exciting team to watch going into National Signing Day. And that's kind of, guys, where it's trending. Like, I think Eric and I were having this conversation at at practice on Friday that, like, for the first time in a long time, Signing Day could go a whole bunch of different directions. And very few people have a a true read of where this is going to go, which – will make it exciting to the point that see what Bong was, was making on his story. It's just been a long time since there's been as many significant recruitments that Oregon is involved in that are going to play out with conclusions on signing day, the early signing period. Usually it's the February period where there's like a couple of interesting things that are taking place that are dragging out. And you don't know. Obviously you have like a Josh Connolly last year who goes after the spring, but this year there's like legitimately, I don't even know how many recruitments are we tracking through signing day, like legitimately of guys that are either committed who might flip to Oregon, guys who are at Oregon who might flip to other schools, guys that are out there. I mean, it's like six to eight 
10 maybe i mean there's a lot of names that there's some that they're like that are worth watching on on wednesday going in. i think it's over 10. yeah i, mean, I, I have... just counted them in my head right there i don't know if you were watching me or not but like i got all, to nine watching. when you said eight to ten and then i still wasn't done so i i think it's 10 or more yeah there's all there's just a lot of like kind of little loose ends here to figure out and and you know there are some five-star players there are some non-five-star players there are players at positions of need um there are players you feel pretty good about oregon ending up with i think like lamar and and, and porter who you mentioned both are guys who there's definitely some positive <clears throat> kind of momentum with so no it's going to be really a, a fun an exciting Wednesday here and we'll have full coverage. And I think we're still trying to figure out what the podcast component of that looks like if we do a live stream or not. I think we should consider doing that. I think that would be probably of great interest to the listeners. So maybe let us know in the comments if you'd like us to do some sort of live stream on, on Wednesday for signing day. But I'm excited. It's going to be fun. It's going to be really interesting to see how this class kind of concludes. And then the other thing is to see, okay, who doesn't sign? Who are the prospects that Oregon will continue to recruit Aside from the transfer players through February, yeah, I don't have a, I don't have too much here to add. Other than that, it's going to going to be an exciting signing day, and I think just for the reasons mm -hmm. that Eric just laid out at the very end there, um, I'm I'm interested at who doesn't sign. I think that's honestly the more exciting part of signing day is is who kind of you know stuns somebody at the buzzer at what school. Maybe it's Oregon, maybe it's a, it's another program in the Pac-12 or whatever. Um, but who delays their recruitment, who gives another chance to a bunch of other schools that maybe thought that they were out of it, but now have the chance yeah. to do it. Um, and then well, this is, this is a different topic in, in its entirety, but, um, and we'll get to it later, but I'm also excited for post bowl game, uh, transfer portal and, uh, announcements from every school in the country, um, which again, goes in line with, well, if, if a certain number of players don't sign for you at signing day, then suddenly you have, you know, potential open scholarships to use during the transfer portal. So everything's kind of overlapping here and kind of mixed in together. So I'm just, it's going to be, it feels like it'll be an exciting like two week span here starting on Wednesday, the 21st. And you guys brought up the, what, who doesn't sign um, two corners that we know that are not signing Roderick Pleasant and Dylan Austin, mm -hmm. two players in the top 150 higher rated corners than Caleb Presley, both highly considering the Oregon Ducks. They are not signing in December. Those two guys, if Presley flips, um, are already like big time targets, but become even more for Oregon next season or for the next signing period in February. We'll track it all. Like Jared said, uh, there's going to be another wave of transfers. We'll track that as well. Um, signing day is going to be here in two days. We'll have something to preview it, hopefully leading up to signing day and then a live stream as it happens. We'll figure those details out here shortly, but you can rest assured that we'll have everything covered here on the podcast, also on duckterritory.com. So make sure to check that out. But until then, thanks for listening to this episode of the Autonomous Podcast. Talk to you later, folks. Peace.